Welcome to Conversations with Lulu. My name is Lulu Hazan. I'm an entrepreneur living in Dubai, an investor, a mother, and your host. My guest is Jonathan Laban. Jonathan is currently the president at Uniphonic. Uniphonic is a Saudi-born startup that has recently raised $125 million to go on a regional and global expansion. Prior to Uniphonic, Jonathan led Facebook in the Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan regions. And before Facebook, Jonathan worked with some pretty cool brands like MTV, Nickelodeon, and Comedy Central. So for more on Jonathan, you can visit conversationswithlulu.com, and there's a bio there, and there's also more information about Uniphonic. So in this episode, I'd like to cover Jonathan's experience in building teams uh, and building a winning culture. We'll also talk about the differences between early startups and scale-ups, which is where Uniphonic is at the moment. We'll cover hiring, fundraising, and we'll touch on Jonathan's one-year uh, sabbatical. And we'll end up with some pretty cool uh, 2022 uh, tech predictions. So Jonathan, thank you for coming. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So let's start with something really interesting that most people don't do in their lives. So you, you were on a, you had a, a great um, a trajectory basically in some, with some great brands. You were employee number one for Facebook here in the region. You built out the office from scratch. And then uh, I'm sure it wasn't one day, but then eventually you decided that you wanted to take some time off. So maybe take us through the highlights uh, of your career and, and up to that moment. Yeah, sure. I mean, highlights of my career, I think there's a couple of themes maybe in my career, right? I think one theme in my career has always been, been a little bit of a global citizen. You know, I'm German originally, my mom is Venezuelan. Okay. And I've, I've loved to always, you know, travel. see people from different cultures travel, right? That's always been a big theme. I grew up in Germany, but even when I was an undergrad, I was spent a bit of time in, in the UK. Um, uh, I did my university time between Spain, Argentina, and Germany, okay. and then my MBA. Do you speak I did many it. languages? Uh, I speak German, Spanish, and English. Okay. Because I'm really bad at languages, actually, um, and <laughs> okay. I only can learn them when I live in a place. Okay. So uh, yeah, so I've lived in in South America. Did my MBA in New York. Lived for a long time in London. So this is a theme, and I love traveling. Um, okay. visit, go, going to crazy places. So this is, I think, one theme of my career, not just personally, but also career-wise. I've moved a lot around in my career, from Germany to the UK to London, Dubai, and so on and so forth. Professionally, it's been quite a mix. You know, I started off being a bit more of a corporate finance consultant, actually, back really? in the day. Yeah, that's what I did. To the okay. I liked finance, I liked corporate finance, but I also like the media space. So I've always okay. been a bit torn between those. So I started off doing corporate finance, consulting, but then from there, I moved to strategy and biz dev. Uh, in media and advertising, worked for a while uh, with Viacom after my MBA in New York. I worked for Viacom. And this strategy was in New York as well? This was initially in New York, actually okay. during my MBA. Then I moved to London okay. and did strategy biz there for them. And then I decided, you know what, I've got to get my hands dirty. And then from there I went from that into sales strategy for emerging markets, which was basically Central Eastern Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Okay. And Facebook was looking for someone that experienced in the region. So it was a really regional play, I think. Okay. Um, I knew that I wanted to change. Um, I joined them in London initially when we were not a big company. Facebook at that time was not big. When, when did you join? 2011. Okay. Uh, so we were zero people in MENA. We were maybe 100 people or so in EMEA. I think maybe 1,000 people globally. This was pre-IPO, right? A lot to be figured out. It was like, okay, which market do we go in next, okay. right? And there was a bunch of offices in Europe. Most of the people were between London and Dublin. We didn't even know if we were going to go to the Middle East and how and where. And then uh, I was the first one come out here in 2012. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I remember your offices in the yes. Business Central Towers in Media City. They were, I think, pretty much as big as this one. This yeah. was the first one. The first size of the office was roughly the size of this, of okay. this, this room here, right? No meeting rooms or anything. If we had we didn't have a meeting, we had to go outside and uh, to a coffee shop and meet someone. And you went hiring. And we went hiring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's been obviously an amazing journey uh, uh, since 2012. Uh, uh, amazing growth spurt. Hired great people. Okay. Uh, but then, so after a while, I decided it was time to go. Yeah. yeah what happened? Good question. But you were like, because you were at the peak uh, at, exactly. at the time. I mean, you, you you know, the organization was much bigger. Yeah. Uh, so it was had you you had gone through the IPO obviously as well. Yeah, we had gone through the IPO. Yeah. IPO was actually 2012. So okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but exactly, we were at the peak. Wow, the IPO and, uh, 2012. Um, it's amazing. It's nearly 10 years now. Yeah, nearly 10 years. 
Um, okay. So that was actually part of the reason why I decided to leave, right? Um, so I said, like, I joined the company when it was much smaller, it became much bigger, and I, I had an amazing time at Facebook, where I really enjoyed it. I have huge respect today still for the team, for what they do. Um, but I also realized that the company was becoming a little bit too big for me, right? I think everyone has their sweet spot in life, and mine is like this growth and building phase. And Facebook was becoming a little bit too big. Okay. And I had been with a company seven and a half years, six and a half years in that role. Okay. And the role had changed a lot, obviously, because Facebook changed so much. But routine was slowly starting to creep in a little bit, okay. right? And, um, and that's why I decided, okay, maybe it's time for a change. And then the third reason maybe why I decided it's time for a change is that I got married uh, at that time okay. as well. And then we, my wife and I said, you know what? This is a great time to, to take time off. Okay. Um, Usually people would, might, might freak out and say, oh my God, I have so many responsibilities now. I have to double down on work. So you went like the opposite went way. The opposite, <laughs> went the opposite. And I think so these were probably the reasons at the time. You know, in hindsight, I think there was probably two other reasons um, that weren't so obvious to me at that time, but that are obvious to me now. Which that are? I've realized now. I think one is, you know, there's this, there's this saying, uh, you know, life isn't a marathon. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, life is not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? Okay. Um, I don't believe that actually. Uh, I actually think life is not a marathon. I actually, life is, I think actually life is a series of sprints. Okay. The more I think about it, if, at least for me, you know, I've always worked a little bit like this. You know, even when I was in, in school, you know, I wasn't like constantly learning and I had an exam. I was like, enjoy life, go full on. Mm -hmm do the exam. Uh, even today, I like, personally, I like to work really hard, but I also like my weekends off. Um, and the same for me is I realize more, so I think it's very healthy to take real breaks in your life as well, right? Uh, because I do think life is more of a series of sprints when you give it all, and then you take a break and you reassess and you think, well, what is happening in the world? Mm -hmm. And you gain new perspective, and you gain new energy, new creativity, and you go at it again. So I think this is probably another reason and then the other, the other one that kind of I also realized in hindsight is one of the reasons why I left is this idea of uh, um, that I felt I was too much in my comfort zone, right? Which, which was the case. Routine was starting to creep in a little bit after you're on a roll for a while. Right? I think this is totally natural. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the more I think about it, there's two ways to, to control this. One is you try to control your actions every day and say, okay, I want to go out of my comfort zone. I want to do Take this every day. Take a new project. Or do this. Like, this is like, you try to control your actions every time. The other way to think about it is to control your environment. And that is something I try to think about a lot more lately after I also read what is called, I think, Atomic Habits. I don't know if did uh, you yes, read it. Yes, yeah. I haven't read it. No, it's but I've heard book. a lot about it's the book, book, actually. Um, it's a good book. So one of the things that he says in order to create habits is you don't just focus on the habits, you, con you control your environment. Right, so by, by saying, you know what, you quit, boom. I knew that I was gonna be out of my comfort zone for at least, you know, a few years, whatever yeah. I do, right? Because I just dropped everything and put everything in storage. And I do this now, this controlling my environment with many things, you know, even ridiculous things. So you, you, took a, you took a full year off, yeah. right? And you went, you just went traveling around the world. And, uh, and what, you know, what, was there something that you, apart from having a great time and discovering new places, was there something that changed or was there something that you came back with? Uh, maybe should there be something deep out of this one year experience? You, uh, you always or? look for this, you know, great yeah. enlightenment. I think there isn't the one enlightenment, but there is okay. certain themes that you come back with, okay. really, that you do. And you need to make sure you don't don't forget about them as you, um, you know, as you're you can share? As, There's a like, couple of things. I think one is, one is, you, know, you gain perspective on life again, right? You see lots of different parts of the world and you gain perspective and you realize, you know what, happiness ends up being pretty much uh, all about yourself and how you look at life rather yeah. than anything else. How right? many countries did you visit? 27. 27? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I think that's one, like, you know, it's really a lot about yourself and uh, perspective. Another one though as well that, surprised me, but I think that was interesting for me is the, is the value of work that it has. Not just from a monetary point of view, but also from a personal point of view, right? Okay. In the sense that what work also gives you, if it's the right kind of role and job, it gives you something to learn. Um, it's something to challenge you, right? So this growth work 
can be a catalyst for growth. Right? Identity also, right? So identity. People, I mean, identify so much with their jobs. Although it's true, although I question if they, if they always should. Um, of course, yes. Um, Probably they shouldn't. Um, but it is for many people. But I think for me, what I realized when I was telling what I was missing was, you know, you can read a lot of books, but unless you do stuff, mm -hmm. right, and actually do things, it's tough to learn and really go deep on something, right? Reading a book about something is never quite the same as yeah. doing something. And the other thing is the social aspect. Work is also a great place to meet people, to engage, right? So I think this was, uh, you know, these were two other takeaways. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so yes. then you ended up in a, in a well, startup or, yeah. I, I mean, at what point was Unifonic when you, when you decided to join them and how, how did that happen? Because, yeah. yeah like, so you ultimately decided to go startup route. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I think as I did my analysis of what I want to do next, right? Yeah. Um, so okay, I'm, I'm still in this phase. I also think there's different phases in your life a little bit, right? Okay. Like everything, like there's time to invest in yourself and then there's time to harvest a little bit, right? Okay. This is true for personal finance, for companies even, right? You invest in, and, and then... <laughs> harvest, okay. And then at some point you harvest, right? Invest in R&D, whatever you harvest. Even for yourself, you invest and you harvest. I still think I'm in the investing phase. So I want to make sure that whatever I do is I grow. I go out of my comfort zone. I put myself in an environment where I need to grow. And Jonathan becomes more valuable, right? Uh, okay. As an asset or as a person or whatever that is. Um, so I wanted to make sure that whatever it is, so that I get out of my comfort zone. But I also wanted to make sure and that I grow. But I also wanted to make sure that it's something that maps to these things that I said earlier. And there was a couple of things that were important to me. One, um, I wanted to be just building and growing again, right? So I, I, this I had the clear realization, this phase of building, growing teams, scaling phase is what I enjoy the most. So that was one. Two, okay. I wanted to make sure that I'm at headquarters because at Facebook, um, I was not at headquarters. I want to make sure that I'm at headquarters where I'm, uh, I'm next. I want to make sure it's a place that, you know, fits, uh, that fits with my values and culture, right? Um, and I want to make sure it's, it's close enough, but not too close to what I've done before, right? So I decided I don't want to do something that's very similar to Facebook. So not consumer tech, basically? Um, or oh, it could have been, or but I needed to have different, right? So I had been in the media advertising at least as a business model space for quite a while, a social network space for quite a while, right? So I needed to be something different. So these were all things that I'm looking for. And then it was pure coincidence. I was even considering, you know, doing my own things with friends, but I was just speaking with a lot of people, right? And okay. I met, uh, you know, various amazing founders along the, the journey. And then through pure coincidence, I think it was a Jitex actually. Okay. I met, uh, I met Ahmad, uh, who's okay. the founder of Unifonic. And we chatted and I really liked him. And and then we, we continue chatting and start to get to know each other a little bit over like two, three months. And then we decided, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Okay. So, so at what level, at what point were they when, when they approached you? Were they, had they raised their first round? They or had were raised they, the first round. Which, exactly. is, which was 20 million Which was 20 million, dollars, exactly. Yeah. And that's yes. in 2018? This was in 2018. Okay. Exactly. And then, so you felt that there was enough fuel maybe in the, in the tank so that you, you can do something, right? Yeah. Would you have taken something that was earlier, that would have been earlier stage? I think for me, the funding um, wasn't the key thing um, okay. because I'm willing to take that risk, right? So like the, I think people that did, did consider whether there's funding or not often, you know, it's more about, oh, is it too risky or not, yes. right? Which is a fair consideration, but yes. this wasn't one for me, right? I take a year off, like so. This this was not the the thing. Okay. Um, for me, what mattered a lot more was: do I believe in the company? Do I believe in the founders? Do, would I work well with the founders? Yeah. I think these were all considerations that were a lot more important. But there was already a real business there, right? I think the other thing is I did realize, independently of funding or not, that it was in this phase, you know, where it is about scaling and putting fuel into the. Um, tank now, right? Um, so adding fuel, I think it was starting, to, it was in that phase. So we were at that point in time, I think about 70 employees. Okay. Um, um, with an office in KSA, which is still our headquarters, and in Amman. Um, you know, today we are um, 225. Uh, people. We have uh, an office in, in Dubai, we have an office in Lahore. We have ramped up revenue and business quite a bit, okay. uh, you know, over the region. I think one figure that is public now is that we are now at roughly 100 million run rate. 
Um, wow. So, you know, it is now at a point where we've scaled quite a bit over the last few and years. And you've raised considerable amount of money. And now we raised yeah. a large round yeah. with, you know, 125. Tell us a bit about Uniphonic as a, as a business. So. Uh, yeah. Unifono was founded by two brothers, by Ahmed and Hassan. Okay, and I didn't know they were brothers. Yeah, they were okay. brothers. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a, Unifonic is a, about 15 plus year overnight success. You know? Okay. So it's not, it wasn't founded yesterday. All right, so uh, Ahmed was in college, Hassan was in high school. Okay. And um, uh, Ahmed was wow. the, yeah, Ahmed was the head of, of the student body, right? And he wanted to engage uh, with, the, with the student community. Okay. And there wasn't, there was, I think, 200, 300 people in that community. There was no way to do that properly over, um, uh, through tech. And okay. so he said, you know, I'm going to call my, my geeky uh, brother Hassan. I said, you know, build me a solution so I can use this to, you know, use SMS to reach out to my student body. And that's how it, that's how it started. It was initially for the university. Then it was So it was messaging. a tool on your, on your computer where, it was, you yeah, where you could message. Then like mass message Mass people. messaging, exactly. Okay. Um, and that's how it started initially. And they stuck to it. So they, I mean, obviously they stuck to it. So they, they, they graduated and then they continued building this company. Um, for Hassan as well, they tried a few new things in between, but you know, they're both full on uh, uh, okay. at it now. And it's been, you know, 15 plus year journey, right? Uh, and so initially it was friends and family. From there, they built a small business. From there, lots of trial and error, right? Um, and also, I think the other learning there is, is you need to be really persistent to make this work because the environment back then was not the environment it is today, yes. right? So think about fundraising then, right? Even yeah. if they were, had all the ideas, you know, it would have been really, really difficult, right? VC didn't exist, right? Correct. Um, so it was yes. a very different amount. So it was, it was all about bootstrapping. They bootstrapped for a long, 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 long time. You know, the money they earned, they put back into the business. Um, and then in 2018, or I think 2016, 17, after they, um, they joined Endeavor as well, which played an important role. Okay. Um, and they saw, okay, this, uh, this could be something really big, um, got exposed to the right people and then said, you know what, let's fundraise, let's take this to the next level, which is when the first round was raised in okay. 2018 um, with the likes of um, STV, Endeavor, Adide, and Elm. And, okay. um, and uh, yeah, today, as I said, you know, it's a, uh, it's an amazing success story, uh, about 100 million run rate, 225 people, 28 nationalities from all over the world. Yeah, and and, work, uh, yeah. and your, your, the, the services have expanded, right? Yeah, so, exactly, so going into that. Um, exactly, so what is Uniphonic? Because that, that's why I was heading towards with like flying under the radar. Like, yeah. It's also a company not a lot of people have heard of, right? Um, and now people are hearing more, more about, but less so before. So let me ask you a question maybe. Like, um, when you have to reach out to your bank or, uh, or your telco Let's provider. Let's not talk about banks. How are you thinking about that experience? Like I when think you have banks have the worst customer, ex uh, customer service. Uh, I think everybody, everybody talks about that, especially in the startup ecosystem. Actually, so maybe even as a, yeah. as a, as a regular person, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. So how do I do it? So, like we think, you know, basically the, the, the feeling is overall customer engagement and customer experience is a, is a broken experience yes. because no matter who you ask, no one really enjoys engaging with the business, right? No one really enjoys that experience. And uh, the thing is, it's very, very easy to blame the businesses, right? It's like, hey, they're not doing it right. Like, you know, we all do this every day long, but yeah. at the same time, I think what we feel is the business that didn't get the right tools to do it well, right? They don't have the right tools to do it. So what we try to do, and what really our mission is, we try to empower businesses to put a smile on your face, right? That's kind of what we try to do. What does that mean? All right, what does that actually mean on a day-to-day -day basis? So you know, if you are a customer of Saudi Post and you want to you know, inquire about your parcel via WhatsApp, mm -hmm. that will probably be powered via us, right? Okay. If you um, get a notification via SMS from uh, noon that you're packages on the way that might be powered through us, right? Okay. If you got logged out of, uh, um, of your service and you need a new password, that would be powered through us, right? So we provide the right technology for businesses to provide a delightful omni-channel customer experience to the, to the, to the okay. consumer. So whether it's uh, WhatsApp, it's uh, SMS. Or it's uh, voice or whatever voice. it is. Voice, okay. Exactly, yes. Interesting. So that's what we do, yeah. 
And uh, it's a big challenge. And if we get it right, I think it will not only put more smiles on people's faces, but also help you know, with the digitization of the whole region, right? It's all about making sure that it becomes a good experience and that, um, that the consumers are happy, the businesses are happy, and therefore grow faster. So, so just to go back on that a little bit, because you mentioned the word scale up, and yeah. then uh, so so most people call themselves startup for yeah. a long time, but then you know maybe what are what are some of the differences from your experience about with startups and scale ups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every company goes through like phases. is it the money only or no no no? There's lots of things. Okay, uh, I mean every company goes through different phases, right? So you start with you know an idea right a problem that you want to solve and typically that means like it's a few people only right um, and you work on that and then you try to find uh, you build a, an MVP right and you try to Make go to market to that product. exactly you know a product and you try to make some money with that and then you try to uh, find product market fit and, and try to find a business model and then you maybe you're in the tens of people right the phase that when I talk scale up and what I mean is it's kind of the phase where you where you found product market fit, and where you have found your. Can you explain for product market fit? It's basically you um, where you've built a solution for the market that the market really wants and is willing people to pay for. People are buying your exactly. product. Exactly, people are buying your, your product repeatedly. Right? Uh, repeatedly, okay. and they're willing to pay for that. Yeah. Right. So huh. that typically means that companies in this phase are. It depends a little bit on the business model, the type of industry, but you're in the tens of people, right, rather than in the zero to uh, nines or you know, the tens or hundreds of people. It also means that you're probably in the millions or tens of millions of revenue. And you're in that phase where you found product market fit, you found a business model that works, and it's a lot about putting fuel and putting fuel onto the engine and putting your foot on the gas, yeah. right? That's what it's really about. So that's the phase I talk about when I talk scale up. And things change quite a bit uh, in lots of areas, right? So. Um, Management, right? Uh, you know, when you're a startup, it's typically about the founders and you can just manage everyone directly. When it's a scale up, it becomes about building a strong middle management, right? This is a, a key thing you need to do. Recruiting changes, it's not just referrals anymore. You need to actually build this recruiting machine, right? Um, systems uh, start to play a really, really important role. You start to need to start to document things, right? Um, things that matter to investors are also different ones, right? Um, uh, when, when you're in a startup, it's obviously, is there a big enough problem? Is there a big enough TAM? Is there a team that, um, that, uh, that can execute in solving that problem, yeah. right? When you scale up, it's also about actually sewing with real metrics, right? The traction that you have and convincing investors that the money they put in, that you can spend the money they put in, mm -hmm. right? So it's less about, okay, I just, you know, giving someone money, it's actually about, can they actually spend this money effectively, right? If, because we're adding a lot of fuel, are they gonna spend this effectively? Yeah. So it changes in many, 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 many uh, areas. Culture, right? Um, culture in a startup is kind of automatic. Culture yeah. in a scale-up, you need to actually put a lot of work into that and making sure it gets lift uh, every day. Communication, communication is, again, it's typically one-to-one, one-to-few in a startup. You need to start to broadcast mm. uh, when you're in a scale up and find ways to broadcast to everyone in the organization, right? So lots and lots of things change. I don't think there's a playbook though. I don't think there's a playbook for scale up, scale upping. I think there's a couple of components that are important, but there's no playbook. I think things that really matter are- So we're all learning basically. We're all learning. Um, and there's playbooks maybe for certain types of startups in certain moments. I mean. Reid Hoffman wrote a great book called Blitzscaling, right? Yes. And which is really good, but it also applies to certain types, and he's very clear about this, it applies to certain types of scale-ups. And not maybe certain all, markets as well. And certain markets too, right? Well, um, the book is here so somewhere, actually. Oh, there it's it is. One of the, yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, uh, so there isn't a play, but I think there's a couple of things that will always matter, and a couple of key learnings. So things that will always matter are, you know, I always think culture uh, matters. Um, more than anything, about nothing else. I always think about culture in a, in a scale up a bit like a steering wheel, right? So, like you have a, a race car, and for me, culture is the steering wheel. It shows you kind of where to go, right? I think about it as something that helps you make day to day decisions. You know, do I do this or do this? Trade off decisions. We can talk a bit more about culture later if you like. Um, I think about 
The other thing that needs to be there is, is the engine of your race car, right? That's your business model, it needs to work. Um, the unit economics need to work if you want to scale and so on and so forth. And that last piece, which I think is almost the most important thing for the scale up is this fuel, right, for your race car. And when I think fuel, I think normally leverage. And I always think there's three types of leverage. Okay. There's people, and that's one type of leverage. It's kind of the oldest form of leverage, right? It's always been around. If you want to do more, if you are an entrepreneur and you want to do more, you hire people. Oldest form of leverage has been around forever. Second form of leverage is capital, right? Funding, no matter if it's equity or debt, mm -hmm. right? That's the second type of um, uh, leverage you need that. And then the third is technology. Um, and the third is probably the one that changed the most. And it's probably okay. therefore also the most important. Yeah. I was very curious what the third was going to be. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought people and capital, but no, I was... No, technology. Like, technology. Why, why technology though? Like, because because imagine, you can scale faster. Imagine what you can do with this technology, with automation today. Yeah. And it's okay. probably the most important one and it wasn't there before. I mean, it's always been there, right? I mean, before you had whatever, the wheel and fire and all of that, that also helps you to do more things, right? But uh, this still happens with technology today. Yeah. And, and where, where can things go wrong, you think, for a scale-up? Because... You know, everything, I mean, as you describe, you probably are able to attract great people if you have your culture in check, even though yeah. I think it's such a difficult thing to yeah. sort of build as you grow. And then you have the capital that's coming in yeah. that's, you know, so where, where, where do things go wrong usually? So I think one of the, there's a couple of, uh, of, of learnings, I think, for, for any organization here. And I think the ones that I typically hear and also experience, I think one thing to watch out for is, you know, we call it uh, um, cultural, technical, and organizational debt. Okay. Um, have you heard of this? Have you heard of this prioritization framework? Um, you know, what's urgent and what's important? Okay. Have you heard of this? No. Like this, like people use this metrics and say, okay, to decide what to do every day, right? Okay. Something is urgent and something is important. Okay. Um, something that um, is urgent and important, both urgent and important, is typically what gets done, mm -hmm. right? And, and often people look at this framework and say, I gotta do the things that are both urgent and that are important at the same time. But I think there is kind of a fallacy to this, to this model, which is okay. that there's really important things that are often not, ur not urgent until it's too late. And those things are culture, right? If you get your culture wrong and then you scale and then suddenly you have a company with the wrong culture and the wrong people, you're screwed. Right. So an example um, would be, for example, people are not accountable, right? Or they people don't... are not accountable, or they just simply just think about themselves instead of the, the company, right? Um, okay. uh, you know, an employee is like it's. You know, it's also why you know when we, we look at our scores of employees, like ENPS, where you say you have the promoters, you the detractors are minus because a, a bad employee can kind of poison everything around them, right? So that's why culture is, is so important. Okay. So you have an ENPS, you have a net, you, you yes, have an internal have, for employees. Yes, yeah. So that's employee net promoter exactly, score. Exactly, yeah. How, how do you do that? You like get other people to rate each other? Um, no, we or have- you, Or uh, it's the manager? Um, no, we, we, use a, we use technology. Uh, okay. So we use a company that provides us with, uh, with a tool and every employee rates um, every week, nice. gets a mini questionnaire on Slack. Wow. Um, I know, technology on Slack, I get it you know, every week and say, how you feel today? Da, 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 da. You do answer three questions every week and therefore you have a continuous sense of ENPS in the company. Okay. Yeah. That's a third party tool? <laughs> what is it called? We use Pecan. Pecan. Yeah, okay. that's how that's, we use Pecan. This is yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sorry, so uh, I cut you out. So, so, so you were talking about so so like culture that you were that. saying. Exactly. Yeah. This is one thing that creeps up on you, right? It's not urgent at the moment you feel, but you feel like, oh, I need to grow and then you forget about this. This is yes. one. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, organizational debt. It's a little bit this, have we actually trained our middle managers, right? Is the, does the organizational structure work, right? Um, this is the second piece. Do we have, uh, have we built certain capacities internally yet or have we not? And the third is technical debt, right? If you, if you, Your system breaks, system breaks, exactly. And oftentimes you, you just, if you want to go too fast and you forget about these things, then they break. So that's kind of what we try to look out for when it comes to when scaling, when scaling uh, fails is that uh, one of these uh, 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 breaks down. I often think it's more about, 
internal factors than let's say the competition or anything else. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. So it usually implodes. It's more, yeah, I think it's more execution and it's about, oh, the competition is coming. You know, we we, we okay. obviously think about competition. Do you worry about competition? We hope everyone thinks about competition, but we try to make sure that it's not our, it's not yeah. our main concern, right? At the end of the day, it's about how do we solve the problems of our customers and help yeah. them to make sure that you smile, right? Um, if we do that well, we're going to be just fine, right? No matter what the competition does. Yeah. Yeah. One of, my, one of my guests once told me uh, when she was referring to competition and she said that when you run, you run looking forward. You don't, you don't yeah. run looking backwards. Exactly. So you founders that exactly. are too concerned about competition end up uh, you know, crashing into the wall, yeah. uh, which I thought was, uh, was quite interesting. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about um, like what, do you, what do you think are some opportunities in the region uh, for people who are considering like starting up, is there is there something attractive that you think people need to think about? I mean, everyone's now is talking about fintech. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money pouring into that. Obviously, post COVID, we talk about healthcare and education. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, I think there's no better time uh, to start. To right? start, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's I think that's <laughs> I agree. Saying, right? By the way. It's yeah. like a great time, what a it great is. time to do something exciting, yeah. to start something, right? Um, because it seems like there's opportunities everywhere now, right? Yeah. Um, so would you recommend if someone's like in their late 30s, 40s, you'd, you'd recommend that they, you know, consider it? Yeah, they consider it, if it's the right thing for them, Yeah. right? Okay. Also think about yourself, is it the right thing for you? I mean, not everyone is an entrepreneur and that's fine, okay. right? Um, but but I if think they've had that urge for a while, I meet so many people yeah. usually and they're like, you know, I've had this idea on the side, I've been thinking about it. And so, yeah, would, yeah. You, would you encourage them? I would encourage generally. Yeah, I would encourage. I think, um, mm -hmm. I, think I heard this the other day and I, I kind of like that, which is this idea that, you know, when you think about career, right, uh, and life, um, you know, a lot of people think about climbing a hill and climbing that next thing, right? It's about, okay, how do I climb that next thing? Mm -hmm. But they always think about their own little hill rather than looking, you know, what bigger hills out, are there out there, right? And we have a tendency to always, okay, I'm getting a promotion, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, in these incremental little career steps of your own hill rather than looking at that next hill, the next hill that is potentially a lot bigger. And I think mm -hmm. there's lots of amazing hills to climb out there right oh, now, nice. right? <laughs> uh, and uh, um, you mentioned some, in the space. Um, I also think another one that I think is really interesting um, is just, you know, B2B, right? Uh, the region, particularly in MENA, has been a lot about B2C over the last 10 years, or so, I would say, and now you start to see more and more in the last few years, you start to see more and more B2B um, So B2B companies. is businesses that caters to other businesses, that to other exactly. businesses B2B, like Unifonic. SAS, like Unifonic, exactly. Um, so I think there's a really interesting space there because at the end of the opportunity is even bigger than in the, in the B2B to C space. If they should do it themselves or join a scale up like Unifonic, it's a different question you need to ask yourself, right? Yes. Um, but being open for change. Joining a company, why not? Why not, uh, exactly. I think it's a great way. Yeah. Um, I was talking to someone from, from the government here, from the UAE government, who are thinking about doing you know, a program to encourage university students to uh, start their own businesses. And I said, you know, instead of doing that, like, why not just do a program that's actually an internship? Yeah. Uh, with comp like great companies yeah. like Unify, there's so many now, yeah. uh, and I think that's the best way to learn. Exactly. And the question was like, yeah, okay, that might get them to learn about startups, but does it get them to learn about how to start? I was like, yeah, it's not, uh, you know, how to start. I mean, okay, yeah. you have an idea and you get started, but at yeah. least you know when you work there uh, how it is. Exactly, and that you know, oftentimes people first join a startup and scale up as an employee and then they do it themselves. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, exactly. uh, it's often the best school to become an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're, you're, um, so you're in tech now pretty much uh, plugged in and, uh, and I wanted, you know, I really wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on what your predictions would be for, for next year. So let's go, you know, uh, crazy a little bit. Like what, what do you think, uh, what are we going to see in tech next year, whether it's the region or whether it's globally, like, do you think there are big trends that are shaping up? Yeah, I think, first of all, I think this, I do think this will continue, right? So if you think about tech and the impact it will have on society, I don't think it will slow down. I think it will continue, okay. right? And yes, there will be ups and downs, no matter, obviously, right? There, there will be ups and downs, but I don't, I just don't see it stop, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, overall, I'm also still, I'm also a, a tech optimist, okay. right? So you believe I think that tech is solving. I do think that tech is net net good for the world. Okay. I think tech can be used for good. I think tech can be used for bad. But I do think net net, it's a positive okay. for innovation and for people around the world. I think particularly in this part of the world. So that's kind of my, my overall, you know, tech uh, optimism. Okay. Um, so I think we will continue. And, and it's tough to predict what we'll see. But I think we, I talked about BDB. I think we'll see more. I think we will see a lot more um, startups and ideas from this region. You know, there's, there's always been this dream that, um, um, I think Chris Ritter also wrote about this on his, his book, but that actually entrepreneurs, that entrepreneurship can come from anywhere in the world. Yes. Right? Um, and I think this is something I'm starting to see, which is amazing. And I think COVID actually helped with that, right? Uh, it's funny how COVID had impact on a couple of things and accelerated a couple of things. And I think one of them is this, right? Is that actually entrepreneurship can come more and more from anywhere in the world because people can work from anywhere in the world, yeah. right? Um, fundraising, it didn't have to happen in person anymore. Suddenly, you know, you, you close deals and had conversations with investors from all over the world. So this concept of you know, we call it a little bit the cloud dream, you know, where uh, at Uniphonic, where like entrepreneurship and ideas can come from anywhere in the world and go from there to the rest of the world. So I think this is another trend that we will, um, that we will see more and more of, including from this region finally, right? We've been kind of waiting for this for so long in the region. I think now we'll see it. Yes, it will come with ups and downs. Don't get me wrong, yeah. right? There will be some disappointments along the road. But overall, I'm seeing that as kind of, I think, a big, 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 um, trend the other one and you, you asked me a little bit about this you know when we were chatting earlier yeah you asked me about the metaverse i um, mean everyone's talking about everyone is talking about, about it, it right yeah, yeah. Is this i mean people also people's visualization of yeah. what that might look like are we all going to be like uh, you know sedentary we're going to have i don't know slurping with sippy cups and have these uh, big masks on top of our heads yeah. and we're like how, how is that going to impact life? Sorry, I digressed a little bit. No, uh, look, I think there is, I do think there's something there, right? I, I think, yes, we will see this, but it's not, it's not, it's going to be gradual. It's not going to be, hey, suddenly we all have just, you know, even if you think about Meta as a company, right? It's not just about um, Oculus, right? It's a lot about, it's about augmented reality as well. It's about mixed reality. It's how we combine physical with digital and making sure that yeah. we don't just look at a screen, Right? Currently, how we in, in, interact with, uh, with digital environments, we look at our phone, we look at our screen and interact with it, so that we're actually in that environment and interact with it. I think that trend will continue, no matter what. It will continue. It is, you know... Scary, to be honest, uh, like when I think about it. I, I, I get worried for my kids. But I think, I mean, this goes a bit back to this, you know, I'm still a tech optimist. I think it is, yes, there is worries and there's things we need to watch out for. Okay. But I'm, I'm not worried because, you know, people were worried about the car. Um, terribly worried about it. People were terribly worried about the radio. People were terribly worried about the TV. Okay. People were terribly worried about computer games. Um, I, um, yeah, I think we will figure this out as humanity, right? Okay. We will figure this out. Um, yeah, we need to watch it, but I think we will figure it out because there's also good about this, right? Um, being able, again, to interact with people all over the world in an immersive way mm -hmm. and finding the right balance between the two again it doesn't mean that you're always going to live in a, in a digital world and that mm -hmm. you're always going to have a mask on right um, um, so i think we'll figure it out um, you also asked me you know who's going to win when mm. we're chatting about this the, area, the, right? the metaverse the game, metaverse game. Yeah. it's like uh, I, i'm not as close to this as i used to be right so take all this with a pinch of salt but i don't think i don't think there's going to be one metaverse okay um, i think there's going to be a multitude of mini verses around and we need to make sure that there is um, interconnectivity between these where you know hopefully you don't want these kind of walled gardens uh, I mean you don't want like a Facebook to become a, a metaverse and then if you want to play you have to be there otherwise exactly exactly and this actually to be honest uh, interoperability has always been a big theme for Facebook um, and then though because of data privacy it, and, and, and the challenges that it comes with when, any, when you port your data from you and give the data to someone else it became more siloed. I do hope that we will go to a world where you know data will be shared between little mini metaverses and I don't think that you will have Facebook winning or Apple winning. I think there's going to be lots of different metaverses. I do think that everything that's happening, you know, in Web3 and yeah. crypto, whatever you want to call this it, is what the Web3 I think people it's, uh, I think it's an interesting to space too. And um, I do think they will all 
interact with each other and we need to see if there's really one winner. Mm. Yeah. I think my only vision of the metaverse is, you know, the 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 presentation that Mark Zuckerberg did uh, with, you know, with him in a kind of alternative environment and so on. So I'm I'm just trying to think, is that it? Is this what it's going to be? Uh, like, okay, I can make my room look like something else or, you know, I can join you if like you're at a conference. I mean, I don't know. Is that even realistic? It is. I mean, I think it's part of it. Again, it's not just, it's not just that. It's going to be a lot of other things too. Yeah. But I think um, basically in, rather than interacting, um, you know, with your phone, being immersed in the digital world and interacting with others is part of it, but it doesn't have to be, it can, augmented reality plays a big role as well, right? Reality or mixed reality, like augmented reality, where you're like with reality and, um, and uh, augmented reality together, okay. right? This also plays a big role. So yeah. it's not just the mask and not just what you've seen there, but I think that's part of it. Have you tried it? The Oculus? Yeah, yeah I have one. Yeah. I have one. Uh, I love it. I think, I mean, but I love it for 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, because apparently for some people it's very disorienting and yeah. some people can get yeah. like physically sick yeah. from it uh, because they feel like dizzy or nauseous or yeah. something. I, I really like it. My kids love it. Yeah. Uh, Beat Saber or what is it they're playing? No, no we just, I just put animals for animals. them, you know, yeah. anim <laughs> animals in the jo elephants, yeah. whatever. I think yeah. it's such a nice, it's, such, it's, a, it's a wow experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. any other predictions? I think this is going to be a big one. I do also, you know, I'm by no means an expert, um, but when I see the amount of talent that's currently going into whatever you want to go to crypto or Web3, I do think it's a space to watch. Yeah. yeah. Have you personally invested in crypto? I have, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I did start in 2017. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. But, uh, but, you know, I'm not by no means an expert. And, okay. Um, I don't think, yeah, I mean, you meet lots of people. Most people I meet in crypto today are self-taught and yeah. they're like super passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's all new. Yeah. Uh, I was even approached recently to participate in the DAO, uh, yeah. which I thought like, okay, I'm, I'm just so curious. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, exactly. I think there's a lot, there's a lot going yeah. on there. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you Great. so much. Thanks so much for having Great me. It was insights. a pleasure. It was exactly. super interesting. Really. Thank you, Jonathan. Good. Thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Conversations with Lulu and uh, this great chat with Jonathan Laban. I hope you found it informative and inspiring. Uh, it was great to hear about his sabbatical. I think it's quite brave. Not many people tend to do that. And uh, there's definitely something for everyone to consider, to think about. As he said, life is a series of sprints and not necessarily a marathon. Definitely something to consider. As usual, I'd love your feedback. You can uh, visit the website conversationswithlulu.com slash contact and you can reach out to me for, uh, for feedback, for guest recommendations, for speaking opportunities uh, and more. There are different options there on the website that you can choose. Uh, you can also follow the show on uh, or reach out to me on social media. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram at Lulu Hazen. Please consider subscribing on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps in getting the show discovered and in getting more listeners uh, and in spreading the learning. Uh, there's definitely lots of things I'm considering for 2022. Um, and so I would really love your feedback uh, on you know, your favorite episode, what you've liked, what you don't like, what you'd like to see more of, uh, some of the guests that really stood out for you. I'd really love to get your opinion so that I plan 2022 uh, more efficiently and effectively so that we can get you the best uh, content. Um, I want to wish you a great 2022 and, uh, and happy holidays and see you guys again very soon. And thank you so much for being a listener to Conversations with Lulu for the past two years.